Good morning, good morning, good morning. <clears throat> today is July the 12th. <clears throat> and my lesson today is teaching from the, um, the standard lesson commentary Sunday school book. Today is a Sunday school lesson. And I will be teaching from this standard lesson Sunday school book. And we're on page 385. Page 385. And today's lesson is talking about the boy Jesus. The boy Jesus. And the devotional reading is coming from Leviticus 12, 1 through 8. Leviticus 12, 1 through 8. And Numbers 3, 11 through 13. And the background scripture is coming from Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 15. And Luke 2, 39 to 52. 39 to 52. And today's lesson will start off with Ecclesiastes 3 1 7 B. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. And then we go to 7 B. And a time to keep silence, a time to speak. And then we go to Luke 2.39 to 52. Luke 2.39 it says, When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong, and he was filled with wisdom and grace, and the grace of God was on him. And verse 41, every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among the relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his mother saw him, they were astounded. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why did, <clears throat> he said, Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know that I... <clears throat> had to be in my father's house. But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in the favor with God and man. And the key verse is, the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom. And the grace of God was on him. And now today lesson, in today's lesson, it aims <clears throat> to teach each one of us and to recall key elements of the story of the boy Jesus in the temple. And help us to explain the defying expectations which was grounded in his, in his unique nature and calling. You know, he had a, you know, a, a, a great calling. And you should be able to write a prayer or, 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 of commitment to choose godly wisdom 
over secular wisdom at all times. Okay, in the introduction today, raising a child star. You know, a lot of child stars and children had very a, a lot of problems, like um, like Shirley Temple and Michael Jackson and Gary Coleman. All these child stars were having a hard time, and they were having a uh, they ended up being popular. You know, they were children with exceptional talent that attracted a large audience eager to be amazed at the youngsters who could outperform adults. You know, imagine an adult who nurtures a, and guards a child that has all these attributes and all the usual principles of parenting have to be ignored so that the child's full potential can be realized. You know, you have to have certain friends, certain schools, certain play, certain discipline. How can, caring, how can caring parents ensure that their child's life is as normal as possible and the pressures of the limelight, you know, it's a sad story that many child stars, you know, that their path to adulthood is not easy. They end up on drugs or they commit suicide. So, Excuse me. Hello? All right, I'm on Facebook. Yeah. All right. Bye-bye. I was that the pastor called me because I'm on Facebook, but he thought I was on God's Will Christian Fellowship. But anyway, but the child stars, they commit drugs, they have drugs, they have suicide, they commit all kinds of stuff that people don't understand, <clears throat> and a lot of people just, just, just lose it, you know, you know, child stars, you know, you think they're going to be happy because they're getting all this money and fame and fortune, but a lot of them can't even, can't even, can't even, you know, can't even, um, fathom all that money. They can't even control all that money. And run and run and run and have all this money. And next thing you know, they're on drugs and they want everything else. And see, raising a child star and having an unusual child is totally different. That's why you ought to cherish your smart children. Cherish your children that are good and children that are great. And, you know, and, 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 and just being you know, something that's exceptional at school. And people that, you know, children that are just, you know, willing to do the work and put in the work. But the Lord is good and the Lord is great. And the lesson context, you know, is Ecclesiastes. Um, the Old Testament books known as the wisdom literature, Ecclesiastes, explores the accumulated wisdom of its time. It, it asks whether life has meaning, and that's what Ecclesiastes asks. You know, King Solomon, he was uh, he alternated between the principles of wise living and his own discouragement, impression of all the things that he had was meaningless. Even though he was the wealthiest person on earth, he was meaningless. A lot of things were meaningless. But in the end, he concluded that the purpose of human life is to remember that the creator before our life slip away from us. We got to remember the creator. A lot of times we don't remember the creator. We just look at things like, you know, the world is around, the coronavirus is all messed up and everything else. We're looking at everything that's really, really bad. The world is good, and the world is, you know, is kind. We got to worry about the creator himself. I hear you. And the four Gospels, only Matthew and Luke give stories of Jesus' birth, and, the on, and only Luke includes the story of Jesus' childhood. It comes just after the account of the announcement and the birth 
of both John the Baptist and Jesus. Luke portrays both birth as vital parts of God's plan. Um, the two men, the two men's ministry later would be linked. Jesus had a uniqueness in his, and it was evident because he was a unique kind of preacher. Jesus is the greater, Jesus is greater than all those who, because his nature and his authority of God himself. In Jesus, God entered the world to rescue his people. He entered his world to rescue his people. Okay. Now we're going to wisdom and seasons. Verse 1, there is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the sun. Everything and every activity are parallel at a time, has a time and a season. Okay, there is a reason for a season. Why? Let me see, let me see where we at. Um, everything and every activity are parallel as our time and season. The writer considers how life begins, develops, and ends in largely consistent cycles. The wise person will understand those cycles and live in harmony with them. Since God creates the emotions that uh, attend these rhythms of life, those emotions should not be suppressed. While wise people accept even the burden or painful realities that we cannot change. <clears throat> And a reason for a season. We still don't know why God allows such sorrow. Maybe it's not the reason to our reason to know. Maybe we'll never know. Regardless, we can rest peacefully in the knowledge that the Lord, the only one who needs to know, knows. Because a lot of things we can't explain, a lot of things we can't understand. But God knows. And a lot of things we need to realize that, you know, he is God and we love him and we praise him. We give him honor and glory. And a lot of times when you just need to just be quiet, be quiet. Now in speech, 7B, a time to be silent and a time to speak. We have many occasions to speak to one another, but no less important are occasions when we when we when speech is unnecessary, unwanted, or unharm or even harmful, in sickness and sadness, being silent may be more meaningful than speaking. In loving companionships, time spent in silence can be reassuring. And when standing before those who are older or wiser, we do well to just listen sometimes. And a lot of times you don't have to do anything. You don't have to say anything. You know, especially when somebody dies, you don't have to do a whole lot of talking. And a lot of times you just, your presence is just good enough for those people. And you know, you don't have to do a whole lot of, you know, I know how you feel and everything. Sometimes you just got to sit there and let your spirit mingle with their spirit. And a lot of times, a lot of times that'll give them the reassurance that you love them and that, you know, let God's spirit do the talking, the unseen things. A lot of times we don't have to do a whole lot of talking. We just let the spirit do the talking and we don't have to talk a lot. Um, what problems do you most need to work on when recognizing when to keep silent or when to speak up? A lot of times you let the comforter do it. You let the comforter come in, and the comforter will tell you when to speak, and the comforter will tell you when to just be quiet. And a lot of times, you, it, it, it just being quiet and let the Spirit do the talking is a whole lot better than doing a whole lot of human talking. And that's what we need sometimes. <clears throat> and number two, wisdom in, ex, ex, in, wisdom in exemptions. Ordinary holiday. Okay, verse 39, we're on verse 39, um, Luke 2, 39, Luke 
2.39. When Jesus and Mary had done everything required by the law, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth. Um, the family, you know, went to, went to Jerusalem to dedicate Jesus, their firstborn. And to observe all the laws, you know, it was required for them to, <coughs> to just, you know, dedicate their firstborn. <coughs> In the 12 years since Jesus' birth, Mary and Joseph undoubtedly continued the ordinary rhythms of life. This included raising their firstborn and their other children in Nazareth. Verse 40, And the child grew and became strong, and he was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. We might compare and depict um, Luke's um, um, depiction of Jesus' physical and spiritual growth with one of those um, like Samuel or um, Jesus' own cousin, John the Baptist. But it seemed that, you know, they had developed, you know, ways out of the ordinary. And a lot of kids are like that. They can develop ways out of the ordinary, you know, but their growth in wisdom is not highlighted as it is with Jesus. Jesus' experience of God's grace may compare with Samuel's favor with, favor with the Lord. But the thing about it is, some kids grow up to be exceptionally, you know, they be exceptional. And a lot of parents can't realize it, some do realize it. But some overdo it. Some over, you know, correct their children. Or over, you know, try to live their life through their children. And a lot of times you got to let the Holy Spirit come in and let the, let the Holy Spirit help your child to grow. Help your child to be at peace with whatever he's doing. And a lot of times you can't. If your child don't want to play basketball, don't let him play basketball. Don't force him to do anything. Let the child just grow. Let the child just be who, he, who they are. And let the Holy Spirit come in and be with them and help them to grow up. But, you know, a lot of times the only way you can teach a child is with your lifestyle. And, you know, a lot of times the children will look at you, what you're doing, and how you worship God, and how you keep things, trying, you know, on the right track. Because a lot of times we, we try to tell kids, you know, do what I say, but don't do what I do. You know, don't drink, but, you know, even if I drink, you know, don't you drink. But you got to do, you know, you got to be an example to your child. You got to have a, your, your lifestyle is a constant teaching. How you, you know, how you do, the kid is going to do. So you got to let your kids grow and be strong in the Lord, you know, through, you know, just, um, just let the Holy Spirit do the growing up, you know. But what would you say, because a lot of people say, what is the minimum time that a parent should set aside weekly to devote to their child, um, child's growth in godly wisdom? It is no time limit. It's all the time. And a lot of times, you know, your lifestyle go, you know, does the talking. You don't have to do a whole lot of talking. Let your lifestyle do the talking. And a lot of times you don't have to be telling them, giving them a bunch of rules and regulations. Because if they see you doing the right thing, they'll do the right thing. Sometimes, even if they don't, they'll still grow up and remember that you did the right thing. They'll still grow up and remember that, you know, hey, you know, I did all this stuff against my parents and everything, but they always still did what was right in God's sight. And I know they love the Lord, and it'll rub off on them eventually. But just let the Holy Spirit do the work. 41, every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. You know, as they had faithfully observed the laws regarding Jesus' dedication, Jesus' parents do so again and again throughout his life by traveling every year from their home to Jerusalem to the Passover. Um, that is an annual feast that given by Israel, um, by God to celebrate Israel's deliverance from e um, e 
Egyptian slavery. This observance is part of the family's annual experience. And they couldn't do, they couldn't wait for this. Every year, they couldn't wait for it. Because they get to go dedicate their son, which was 12 years old. And, and they, 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 they lived their firstborn. And they, it was their custom. It was the customary practice for all faithful Israelites to go and do, um, go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. And that's what they did. In verse 42, when he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the customs. At the age of 12, Jesus is not yet part of the adult world, but he is old enough um, no longer to be considered as a child. The Jewish customs of the bar mitzvah, meaning one who is responsible for performing the commandments to mark the passage to adulthood, was not yet developed in Jesus' time. But records from the 2nd century A.D., such as Mishnah, suggest that 13 was the general considerate uh, age when a boy became a man. And a lot of times, that's why a lot of people get this 12-year-old thing. They figure, you know, hey, you know, they get this from the Bible. I found the Lord when I was 12 years old. You know, I was 12 years old when I found the Lord. And, you know, to me it's no number. It's no number. Because I always loved the Lord. No matter how long it was, I always loved the Lord. I can believe, I can, I can, I can, I can see myself... Even right now, remember myself talking to the Lord at five years old, you know, because it was instilled in me. It was instilled in me. And it wasn't no 12 years old. Everybody always say 12 years old because of this bar mitzvah, you know, and was the one who was responsible for com performing the commandments. But I always believed in the Lord. I can't remember a time that I didn't believe in the Lord. I might have been disobedient and doing all kinds of crazy stuff, you know, like kids do as you grow up, you know, but I still had a fear deep down in my heart that I knew that there was a God somewhere and I knew I always had the fear of the Lord within me. So it wasn't a number on my part, you know, because a lot of people got to figure out a number, what time, when, what... New message is received from plus one, three, oh, three, six, six, eight, eight, six, five, three. When they were 12 years old, but I, you know, one, I remember, three, oh, three, six, you know, six, I just eight, eight, remembered six. when the Lord was with me at all times, even when I was five. <laughs> okay, disrupting travel. Verse 43. After the festival was over, while his parents was returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. The Passover consists of an evening feast, the Passover proper, followed by seven days of additional celebration, the festival of unleavened bread. And Mary and Joseph doubtedly was with thousands of other travelers because they, their journey home was the next day. But in an extraordinary act for a 12-year-old, Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, the center of, of Israel's devotion to God. And you know, 12 years old, he had a great devotion for God. And that's the thing about it is, most kids 12 years old ain't even thinking about God. But he had a great devotion of God. He had more knowledge than a lot of teachers had and a lot of preachers had. You know, he, he, he answered their question instead of, he, you know, them answering him because he was asking them and, and, and grilling them on certain questions and stuff. But, and he had a better answer than them. Verse 44, thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among the relatives and friends. The road north um, from Jerusalem was crowded and pilgrims was going home to Galilee. It's likely a chaotic and confusing place. Entire communities traveled together just to go to this great Passover, alleviating parents of specific responsibilities for older children because of the safety of their caravan. 
Mary and Joseph may have been traveling with respective friends and not as couples or family, thus leaving each other to assume that Jesus was with the other. <clears throat> Only at the end of the night that they set up for camp do the parents discover that their eldest son is not e with them either. Their first thought is that he was with relatives and friends. But we can imagine the fear of the parents, because the fear of the parents think they were kidnapped or sold into slavery or some sex slave and everything. You know, they that's why, they, you know, um, Mary was so upset because she was just being a mother. She was just being a, you know, a, a guardian because he was only still 12 years old, you know, and... and and a lot of times they were confused and, and, and they were worried and they got upset about it. And verse 45 says, When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. The parents had no choice but to return to Jerusalem. So they went back and looking for him. And 46, After three days they found him in the temple court sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Boy, he was really... You know, he wanted to, that's like a child 12 years old wanting to go back to church and sitting in the church and asking the preachers everything and asking the teachers everything and, 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 and getting questions and answering. And he was there for three days. You know, that was, it was something special about Jesus because, you know, he was 12 years old and he had the, 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 the hunger of the Lord's word in him because he was the word. He was the word, and he was really looking for answers and, and, and trying to really see if they knew the answer. When they find Jesus, he, in the, he was in the temple courts where Simeon and Anna had identified him 12 years before as God's promised king. 12 years before as God's promised king, it was prophesied. The temple is a magnificent structure with outer layers surrounded by shaded porticos. There people can meet for teaching and discussing the um, God's law of sacred law. And that was like people having Bible study in the vestibule. People were having Bible study in the vestibule. And one group um, this day participated, particularly that they included Jesus, who interacts with the important teachers of the scriptures. Um, the readers readily assume that Jesus is not asking childish questions. He can be answered by expert teachers quickly, not requiring lengthy conversation. So his answers were better than some of the people that, you know, some of the teachers and posts have been people that were really studied in the scriptures, you know, his answers were better than them. Because in this little, in these little porticos, it was like Bible study before you go into the church or out of the church. But it was a place where you can ask questions. And they need a place like that, they, you know, because a lot of people just go to church, but you can't ask questions. That's why Bible study is so good. Because you can't ask questions, you can't do nothing. And a lot of people, you know, just just really don't understand <clears throat> but you got to ask questions and you got to find out what the word of God says because a lot of times we don't really know we just leave church like because the preacher said it and somebody else said it and we don't even study it we don't even study it for ourselves to look at what's going on we don't understand what's going on you know we try to study the Bible and everything but we don't ask questions we don't get deep into it. We don't get it rooted and grounded. Like if you want to be a professor, you got to study other books and get rooted and grounded into it. If you want to know the Word of God, you got to get rooted and grounded into it. Whatever you want to learn, you got to get rooted and grounded into it. <clears throat> In verse 47, everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. The picture is clear that Jesus is talking deeply with experts in the Israel scriptures. He was talking to experts, and he's 12 years old. He's talking to experts. You know, a boy, 
12, doing such thing reveals an impressive interest in God's word. That is amazing. A boy 12, you know, he had an impressive interest in God's word. And these kids today don't have no kind of God's word, don't even have no interest in it. If they had a, you know, a, a, a interest in God's word like they do these video games, boy, we have some amazing, ch amazing children around here. And, you know, and, and it, it'll, be a, it'll, it'll be good. But that's why, you know, the parents, it's up to the parents. At least teach your kids some Bible stories while they're young. Teach them Bible stories. Read them Bible stories. Get them a kiddie book with, 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 with Jesus, about Jesus. And let them study the God's word through that. You know, my daughter still remember, you know, she might have, you know, kind of gone astray a little bit now, but she still remember. I remember when you read us Bible stories. You know, they remember it. A lot of times they don't seem like they do, but it'll get instilled in them. And then they'll come back later on and say, I remember what you, what you used to read us Bible stories. And that stuff stays in their heart because it's the, it's, the, it's the Word of God. And it's going to be there. Okay, and, and at 12 years old, you know, adult experts, you know, engaging and questioning from boy. From the, from the boy Jesus had several different, you know, signals in the youngsters' extraordinary insight. They really couldn't believe that he had so many, had so much good insights, you know. You know, teach your kids about the Word of God. Teach your kids the Word of God. Tell them about the Word of God. But most of all, be an example of the Word of God. Many Jewish boys at Jesus' age... Uh, or we're in the process of learning the text by heart. You know, a lot of times learning the Bible by heart ain't, you know, it ain't nothing if you don't really know what it's saying. Consideration of the meaning of the law often comes after this exercise. As a resident um, of insignificant town of Galilee and a member of a uh, relatively poor family, Jesus likely didn't have many resources for his own education, yet already has exceptional understanding of the law. He didn't have a lot of books and everything, expensive books and everything, but he still had an understanding of the law of God. You know, as evidenced by his thoughts and informed answers, because he was answering them with great godly wisdom. You know, his grasp of God's word uh, apparently surpasses greatly his youthfulness. And a lot of times just because, you know, the other boys was trying to learn the word of God by heart, you know, he was just learning the word, you know, he knew the meaning of the words. He knew the, what was what God was saying in the word. He wouldn't he just didn't learn it by heart, you know. But Jesus did demonstrated his great insight with the, when he was just 12 years old. Though the other boys were committed to memory, Jesus already understood the law and could discuss it intelligently. He didn't have to fill in the blanks. At what stage are you, you in your Bible study? Do you understand what you're reading or are you still trying to fill in the blanks? That's where we come in at this, you know, go doing the Bible in a year and all that kind of stuff. A lot of time we just saying, hey, you know, we we going we going we going to go through the Bible in a year. But did you understand anything that you read? It's best to understand one paragraph than go through the Bible and try to remember everything in a year and go through it in a year and go so fast and say, I did it. You know, I did it because, you know, I already read the Bible. I went through it in a whole year. But you don't really understand what it's saying. You're just looking at the words and going through it real quickly just to say that, you know, you went through it in the Bible. I went through the Bible in a year. I read the Bible in a year. But you didn't stop and really get anything rooted and grounded. It just went right over your head. Just went right over your head. And, and, and that's why, that's what it's talking about here. Jesus knew the Bible when he was 12 years old. He had an understanding of the Bible. He, his, you know, 
he even knew more than his parents. His parents was, you know, they were godly people. But his parents, you know, his parents was, you know, there. And his parents taught him a lot of things. And his parents kept him in a lot of things, you know. And verse 48, when his parents saw him, they were astounded. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Um, his parents were amazed at first. Um, <clears throat> it's not that Jesus is able to talk to the experts um, with his teachers of the law, but rather they were, you know, really worried for him because they was worried about his, um, about his, his health. And if somebody kidnapped him or if, if, if anything was wrong and if he got harmed or anything. But, you know, they, you know, Mary was just being a mother and Jesus' mother, you know, you know, she, 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 you know, she, she was, she had a bunch of fear, you know, because she was a mother. They had been without their son for three days and not knowing where he was and know if they ever see him again alive. So they were upset about that. So, um, C, um, verse 49, why were you searching for me, he asked. Did you know that I had to be in my father's house? Jesus' response implies that his parents should have known exactly where he was when he was not with them. He was engaged with the things of God. And he was engaged with the things of God. And, you know, he was occupied with it. He had to be in his father's house. You know, he said, I had to be. You know, in the case that it occurred because of God's fulfilling of God's purpose. You know, Jesus engaged the greatest and of the contemporaries to consider the true implication of God's word. This conversation are previewed in their later dispute with religious leaders and his final conflict with the temple authority because he was always fighting with the uh, contemporaries and everything. And the thing about it is, do you need to be about your father's business? You know, and he was strictly about his father's business. He was, you know, he, he was... He, was, he loved his father's business. Do you love your father's business, Jesus' business, or do you love everything else besides that, besides God's word? You know, because God is still real and he's still alive and his word is more important and his business is more important than anything. But, you know, a lot of us are, you know, we, we're occupied and, and about our business on the job or in school or, or other things, looking at the computer and videos and all that kind of stuff. But are you about your real father's business? The business of spreading God's word and being God's word and being an example of God's word. Are you really about your father's business? Jesus referred to God as his father in response to the implications from his mother's use of the word father. Though it was not common for those in those days to call God father, um, the concept of God is the father of Israel is important in scriptures. God can be called our father, though generally such an address is considered to be too familiar. Jesus says, in my father's house. This expresses Jesus' awareness of his unique divine identity. Um, even as a young child, he knew he had an identity. He knew that was his real father. He undoubtedly knows the Old Testament scriptures in which God refers to him as the promised king as his son. He surely is also that angel Gabriel um, that told Mary that Jesus would be God's son. So Jesus expressed no surprise that his role in God's plan 
would cause distress to those who love him. Simeon prayed. Simeon had warned Jesus' mother that a sword would pierce your own soul too. Jesus' three-day absence from his parent ends in a joyous but perplexed reunion. Um, this is the first time that Jesus um, really, his calling caused his mother grief. Her grief will all be all too greater than Jesus' um, when he surrenders to his death. It, this calling is really going to cause her really grief, you know, because he was the son of God and, and his calling was going to cause her grief. Um, in the wisdom of God, the solution to human brokenness is for the divine son of God to take punishment for humanity on himself. Um, verse 50, but they did not understand what he was saying. Mary and Joseph was well, um, they know the angelic and prophetical words spoken to them um, when their son was first born. But yet, fulfilling those prophecies must wait, as ordinary life demands attention. The outward appearances, Jesus is like, is, is a child like any other child, but he was devoted to God, and he was devoted to his work, and he was devoted to men, and he was devoted to mostly God's word. And he really, you know, devoted to God's wisdom. God's wisdom demands that human value be turned upside down. His wisdom requires the almighty Son of God to take on the human flesh and suffer and torturous life and death to reconcile God to his unworthy people. Jesus' wisdom and knowledge of God's plan challenge everything that people believe. Every difficult word that Jesus speaks provokes the listener to ponder in his order to understand. You know, a lot of time, every difficult word that Jesus speaks provokes the listener to ponder in order to understand. A lot of time we don't understand. And a lot of times we, you know, we don't want to understand. And sometimes our, our, our carnal mind keeps us away from understanding certain things. But return to ordinary. Verse 51a. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. So he ended up being a still obedient child. He knew what he had to do, but he still had to be an obedient child because he was only 12 years old and he still had to go you know, down to Jerusalem. The whole family now returns to their home in Nazareth. you know, Until his ministry begins when he's about 30 years old, Jesus apparently remains obedient to his parents in some sense. This, this um, implies um, not acting in unexpected ways as he has on this occasion. Because a lot of times they wouldn't understand certain things, so Jesus had to suppress a lot of things because he was great and he was marvelous and he, was, he had superpowers and everything else, but a lot of things he had to suppress just because you know, his parents really wasn't understanding the, the, the great spiritual things that he had and the great power that he had because he was the son of God. Even though Mary does not immediately understand stand the implication of what was happening, she remembers this event and ponders its meaning. She reacted the same way regarding the events of Jesus' birth. And she remembered a lot of things she didn't understand then and she didn't understand a, thing, a lot of things now, but she knew it was still of God because she still had it in her spirit that, you know, a lot of these unexpected, unique episodes could be only understand um, on the other side of Jesus' death and resurrection. When the wisdom of God revealed and Jesus comes to, come to its unexpected, victorious climax, um, we can imagine that Mary tells these stories over and over to followers and believers in the early church in them days. 
You know, a lot of things she didn't understand, but she still told a lot of people and told a lot of people that Jesus was still, you know, uh, he was a special child. That he, he, he knew that it was certain things that he needed to do and certain things that he had to come, that had to come through him. So, you know, don't worry about your children, but just teach them in the way that they should go. Teach them about the word of God. You know, so that they it might look like they don't hear you. They might look like they don't see you. But read them Bible stories. Read your kids Bible stories. Let your kids learn. Let your kids walk and talk and, and just love you. And, just, and they'll love the Lord and they'll remember those stories. Even though they go astray, there'll be a covering of them. Then they'll come back sooner or later. Even when they get old, they'll still not depart. So the Lord still will be with them if they, you know, a lot of times they remember those Bible stories. But Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor of God and man. He grew in, and he will grow in favor with God and man, especially with God. A lot of people, you know, we're looking at things and uh, all this ungodly stuff don't even matter to us these days because the coronavirus has messed up a whole lot of stuff. And, you know, and you know, and our children are messed up. I don't know how they're gonna do this thing with the schools when the schools don't have no air condition already, and then they gotta go in there with masks, especially elementary school, and they gotta keep a mask on every day. Everything's so confused and so messed up right now. So um, you gotta really pray over your children, and you really gotta tell them about the Lord, because if they don't have the Lord in their system. Sooner or later, you know, they're going to break down and they're going to have a nervous breakdown and because they everybody's losing hope, especially the children. That's why people just being rebellious and going out and doing what they do, you know, because they don't have any hope no more. They don't have any hope. They just want to make it get back to normal no matter what it looks like. They don't care, you know, but everybody losing their money, everybody losing their jobs, everybody just walking around just in space and don't know what to say, don't know what to do, and things ain't happening right for them anymore. But you got to teach your children about the Lord. For first, you got to teach yourself about the Lord. You know, you got to teach yourself um, some understanding about God's Word so you know what's happening in this world and know what's going to happen later on. Because things are happening so fast, you know, we're losing hope. You know, ask the Lord for wisdom. Ask the Lord for grace. Ask the Lord to forgive you. Ask the Lord to just come in right now and just share, you know, your heart with Him. And things will change. He'll take away that fear. He'll take away, He'll give you peace of mind. He'll give you love and, and, and more uh, of abundance of life. This isn't life. You know, Jesus is coming back. So it's not a game, it's not nothing that you can laugh at, it's nothing that you can, you know, think, think if you don't think about it, it'll go away, because it's not going to go away, you know. But Jesus' growth and wisdom, um, he grew in wisdom, you know, um, human approval is fickle, you know, approval by God endures God's wisdom is on display in the boy Jesus. Um, and that will have the final word. God's, you know, wisdom and display on the boy. And so, you know, and God's wisdom will have his final word on you. You know, and in the conclusion, define expe ex expectations. How do we comprehend something that is fundamentally different from others? Every other thing which we have experienced. Ecclesiastes speaks of the regularity of life cycles, showing the wisdom of understanding of circumstances. Do we understand all circumstances? No, we don't. But we still have a Savior that does. You know, Jesus defied the conventional wisdom of those cycles as he spoke in the temple at age 12. And a lot of things you got to do that's unconventional. And a lot of things you have to believe that's unconventional. 
But God is still on the throne. And a lot of people are, you know, we're losing hope now. We're losing hope, people. We got to get back to, you know, the Word of God and believe in God. Because that's the only thing we got left. Our job can't save us. Our money can't save us. Other people can't save us. All we have is God. God is right now separating, separating the wheat from the chaff. And he's seeing who's his and who is not his. And a lot of us, you know, we say we are his, but we're turning to other things and, and trying to figure out other things except, except letting God come in. And Because you know why we don't really believe it? Because we can't see him. He's an invisible God. You know, you know that's why we got to look at the unseen thing. And it's hard for us to look at the unseen things in life. But God is coming back. And as people called into fellowship with Jesus, Christians are to follow God's purpose in mundane daily ways. Ways that we that can give way to suddenly to our sayings and doing the unexpected. There's going to be a lot of unexpected things that happen. And we're going to be doing a lot of unexpected things for God if we trust God. For us to expect to do only and always the unusual is not God's way. Even so, God will, God will, <clears throat> God's will can run counter to conventional expectations on many occasions. Expect the world to scold us for defying its expectations as we continue to follow in the surprising direction of God and Jesus' footstep. Because a lot of people ain't going to understand us. A lot of people ain't going to. They, they starting to hate Jesus more and more. They, they, they won't say Jesus' name nowhere. They won't say Jesus. Is, you know they look at. You know as soon as you say something about Jesus. They, you, they act like you said a bad word or something. You can do all this cussing. And putting all this stuff on TV. And all this sin. And there's a difference between civil rights and sin. There's a difference between civil rights and sin. Because a lot of people, you know, they're using this, you know, sin and, 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 and trying to mix it in with civil rights and everything. But God is coming back because the devil is part of this. The devil is the big, you know, God is allowing us. To, he, didn't, he didn't bring this on. You know, the devil bought it, you know, put all this stuff on. God is just allowing it. And he's, and he's really seeing who's his or who's not because he's separating the weak from the shaft. And a lot of us are still, you know, depending on the word. I mean, the world, instead of the word, we're depending on the world and trying to find out what will the world do? What is the world going to do at a time like this? But we're not studying the word of God. God wants us to study word the word and be closer to him at this time and a lot of us are still pulling further and further away from him they're pulling further and further away from him at a time like this and he really wants you to come closer and closer and closer to him each and every day especially during times like this you should be really getting closer to him but a lot of times we, we're getting closer to everything else Trying to find a money and job and a person and dogs and cats and, and all this kind of stuff. But nobody's not, you know, pulling closer to the word of God and the spirit of God. The unseen things. Because you can't see them so you don't really believe in them. But our prayer for today is, Father, challenge us to grow in your wisdom as Jesus grew. In his name we pray. Amen, amen. And the thought to remember, being about Heavenly Father's business is our task. No matter what, being about our Heavenly Father's business is our task. No matter what, we still got to be about our Father's business. And that is our task. No matter what the situation look like, no matter what's going on all around us. But be joyful. 
and be happy that the Lord is with you and the Lord is, is going to continue to be with you. You know, he's in you, through you, and all around you. And don't worry about what's going on in this world today. But just love the Lord and be with the Lord. Because he is with you no matter what the situation looks like. Amen, amen. And that's our lesson for today. I want to thank you for listening. And choose the Lord. Because things are going to get worse when it comes to things, you know, in the world. But the, the things are going to get light and big in the word in the word of God. So choose God and be happy and be joyful and then change your evil environment into a godly atmosphere because the Lord is real and people are watching. Amen and amen. I want to thank you all for listening. Amen. Thank you.